Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th edition of the CFA Society Brazil uh, annual conference. My name is Felipe Nogueira, and I'm the president of the CFA Society Brazil. And with me, we have Gustavo Moreira, vice president of the CFA Society Brazil and responsible for the research challenge. Today, we have the pleasure to have Professor Aswat Damodaran with us. He's back after three years. Uh, for those uh, who weren't here, uh, he was the keynote speaker of our seventh annual conference. And I can say that it was one of our most crowded events. And the Itaú Auditorium did not have enough seats to accommodate all of our guests. It was also one of the most entertaining and interesting presentations we ever had. So thank you, uh, Professor, once again, to be back here with us. I would also like to thank everyone that's here with us, uh, the board of the CFA Society Brazil, uh, Gustavo Moreira, Ruth Walter, Marcia Sadzevicius, Sonia Villalobos, Flavio Papelbão, Lucas Correa, Rafael Junqueira, and Daniel Celano, our PCR and former president, Mauro Miranda, our executive director, Everton Rodrigues, and all the volunteers, members, candidates, candidates staffs, and colleagues from other societies who are here with us. If anyone by any chance does not know CFA Society Brazil and wants to learn more about our society, please visit our website or reach out to our members, uh, to the members of the board of, or the staff. I don't want to take too much time with, with the introduction, so I'll be very brief. I'd like to mention two very important initiatives that CFA Society Brazil is working on this moment. The first one is a project called Young Women in Investment. For those who haven't heard, the goal of the program is to create awareness about, instill interest and enable women to view the investment management industry as a viable long-term career option. The program is selecting 35 women from Brazilian universities and will provide them with a one month training program on finance and soft skills. After the one month, they will be hired as interns on top employers, banks and buy side firms who have partnered with us. We are right now in the middle of the selection process and classes are planned to start in January. And we had over 4,000 signups. If you want more information, please visit the website uh, www.uwin.org.br. The second initiative is an ESG certification that we are launching in Brazil in partnership with the CFA Society UK. The certificate in ESG invest, investing is a modern qualification that, that has been developed to deliver the knowledge and skills required by investment professionals to integrate ESG factors into the investment process. If you want more information, please reach out to, to the CFA Society Brazil. I'd like to hand over to Gustavo, who will speak about the research challenge and will introduce Professor Damodaran. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gustavo Moreira, and I'm the vice president of the CFA Society Brazil. And I have one final message about the research challenge, because among one of among uh, main of my roles <laughs> is the organization of the research challenge here in Brazil. So uh, together with Luana, our intern, and Everton, our executive director, we've reached remarkable results. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, the research challenge in Brazil is the largest of the Western Hemisphere and the second largest of the world. We're only behind India. Okay. Uh, and not only that, but uh, last year uh, was a special year because uh, our two winners in Brazil, which were INSPIR and Poly, Poly USP, they also reached outstanding results. Uh, they both won their regional semifinals and our two teams were finalists of the Americas level of the CFA Research Challenge. And proudly, uh, Paul USP won the Americas final and was a global finalist. So uh, we are very uh, proud of that. And now shifting to this year's Research Challenge, uh, as we speak, uh, the student reports are being uh, reviewed, are being evaluated by a number of graders. And after these assessments, uh, we compile the grades and we announced the eight local finalists, which are the eight best teams to participate of the Brazil final. And out of these eight teams, uh, we select the, the top two that represents us, that represents CFA Society Brazil in the international levels, uh, like uh, INSPEF and 
USP uh, did last year. So uh, I must appreciate uh, the effort of everyone involved, not only from our staff and our board, but I want to appreciate the effort from the 50 teams that are participating of the Research Challenge Brazil this year, which add up with more than 200 students, 50 professors, and a massive support from you guys, from more than 100 volunteers that are divided among mentors and graders. So thank you, thank you all. And uh, now I would like to welcome Professor Damodran. Uh, professor Damodran, in addition to be a top tier author and panelist, he's a finance professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University, where he teaches corporate finance and valuation courses. Uh, Professor Damodran has received his MBA and PhD degrees from University of California at Los Angeles. So uh, without further ado, I welcome Professor Damodran and I thank you for his time. Thank you, Gustavo. <clears throat> I, uh, I welcome all of you in, in here. And as Felipe was mentioning, uh, your ESG certification, it's a good thing you didn't ask me to come and talk about ESG because you really don't want to hear what I would say about ESG. I'm nothing good to say about ESG, so might as well say nothing about it. But that's for a different day and a different topic. So what I thought about talking about today is what's on everybody's mind, which is 2020. I mean, 2020 is the year that never ends, right? It's one surprise after another, and almost all the surprises are negative surprises. And for much of this year, we wallowed in the aftermath of this virus because it's affected economies, affected markets. So I thought I'd take you back in time to February 14th and take you on a journey over the last eight months on what this crisis has done to markets, all kinds of markets, and how to make sense of what's happening. Let's face it, in every crisis, three things happen. The first thing is you lose perspective. Why? Because you're surrounded by chaos. Things are melting down around you. You lose perspective. The second thing that happens is you lose faith. Faith in everything you thought you knew. All that stuff you learned in your CFA, many of you I know have given up on that stuff because it doesn't work when you're in a crisis. So you lose perspective, you lose faith. And the third thing that happens is you outsource your thinking. You know what I mean by outsource your thinking? You look to experts to tell you what to do. You call in consultants to tell you what to do. They're all very unhealthy developments, but they're almost guaranteed to happen. And I'd be lying if I didn't say that I didn't go through those three phases, but I went through them pretty early in this process. In fact, one of the things I've been doing during the course of the eight months is I've been writing about the crisis in real time. Let me explain. Most people, when they write about a crisis, write about it two years after it's done. So about the 2008 crisis, you see people writing about it in 2010. I think that's a little deceptive. And here's why. By 2010, everybody knew how the crisis had played out. You can act like a genius because you can see how things played out. So I said, I'm not going to do that. And in this crisis in real time, every two to three weeks, I wrote a post on what I was feeling, what I was thinking, and essentially put down on paper where I was at that point in time in the crisis. For those of you who read my blog, my 14th and final post on the crisis came out earlier this week. Now, in fact, I think it came out on Monday. If you get a chance, visit them. There are 14 posts from February 26th, my first post, to the November 1st post. So what I thought I would do is take what I've learned over the last eight months and summarize it into five broad lessons. Let's start with the first one. In every crisis, people like to pick on markets, right? They say markets are crazy, markets are chaotic. Look how volatile they are, which is an absurd critique. Have markets been volatile? Of course. But let's face it, we're all uncertain, right? You look out of the window and say, what will I be doing two months from now? None of us has an answer to that. If we're all uncertain about... Right? We're all uncertain about the future. Why would you expect markets to be stable? And I'm gonna make a statement, I'll try to back this up, that this has been the most orderly crisis I've seen in markets in my lifetime. In the 40 years I've been observing market crises, this has been the most orderly crisis. So to set the discussion up, I'm gonna draw a contrast between two words we use interchangeably in finance that we should not. You know what those words are? Value and price. We act like the two words we can use interchangeably. Many of you claim to value companies when in fact, what you're doing is pricing companies. In a minute, you're gonna see the contrast because here's what drives value. 
Value is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. That's it. Cash flows, growth, and risk. That's always been true. In the last 100 years, though, we've developed an architecture for bringing cash flows, growth, and risk. And it's, of course, a discounted cash flow model. But don't act like we invented this. People have always known that value is driven by, <clears throat> by cash flows, growth, and risk. You know what drives price? Demand and supply. You're saying, aren't demand and supply driven by cash flows, growth, and risk? Perhaps. But you also have mood and your momentum and liquidity and all those forces driving pricing. And here's the bottom line. The value process delivers value. The pricing process delivers price. And the two can be very different numbers. In fact, for every active investor, this is the basis for your active investing, the belief that there's a gap and that you can take advantage of that gap. When you want to price something, you know, you price it, you look at what other people are paying for similar assets and you price it value versus price. And in a crisis, markets play the pricing game. It's all mood and momentum on a day-to-day -day basis that explains what will happen. So let me draw three contrasts between the pricing game and the value game. Here's the first one. Value is an upper bound and a lower bound. Let me explain. Let's assume you took a company like Tesla, right? And Tesla is one of those companies where you have a huge divergent, divergence of what people think will happen in the future. You could be a supreme optimist on Tesla or a supreme pessimist. If you're a supreme optimist on Tesla, you might give them very high revenues, 300 billion, as much as Toyota Volkswagen, a very high margin because they have a software component and fairly low reinvestment because they're, again, a techie company. And with that, you might come up with a value, but there's an upper bound to your value. You cannot push beyond that upper bound. In contrast, if you're a pessimist on Tesla, you might give them much lower revenues, much lower margins, make them reinvest more like a car company and come up with a lower value, but there's an upper bound and a lower bound. As opposed to what? The pricing process. If you ask me what's the highest price Tesla can go to, the answer is, I have no idea. There's no upper bound in pricing. I used to think there was a lower bound in pricing. You know what my lower bound was? Zero. And I've discovered during this crisis that I was wrong. There isn't even a lower bound. Pricing has no bounds, value is bounded. Second, price is reactive, value is proactive. Let me explain. When you play the pricing game, you know who plays the pricing game? Most of us do. If you're a trader, most portfolio managers, they play the pricing game. What's a pricing game? You buy at a low price, you sell at a high price. If you're playing the pricing game, you are reactive. And here's how you play the game. You look at what other people are thinking about the market or stocks, and you try to get ahead of the game. Remember the old Keynesian description of the stock market? He described it as a beauty contest, where your job is not to judge who the best looking person on the stage is, but to judge who the other judges think the best looking person on the stage. That's what the pricing game is about is gauging mood and momentum by observing other traders. It's reactive. In contrast, value is always proactive. Remember that. <clears throat> when you sit down to value a company, you might use the crutch of past data, lots of financial statements, but your job is to forecast the future. And here's the final contrast, and it's not even a contrast. Remember we talked about the gap? Some investors seem to believe the gap always has to close. Like old-time value investors, think of how they think about investing. You buy something for less than the value. And they say, well, the price has to converge in value, to which I'm going to push back and say, why? You can have a, a stock that is undervalued become even more undervalued and stay undervalued for decades. There is nothing in this process that causes convergence. So with that background, let me set up what's happened over the last eight months. If this were a play, I would say it's a play in three acts. And let me explain. Coming into 2020, and I'm going to focus on two US, two, two U.S. equity indices, but I'll come back and talk about the rest of the world in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to focus on the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Coming into 2020, both indices were coming off really good years. U.S. equities were up about 30% in 2019. You were coming into 2020. And in the first five weeks of 2020, stocks continue to rise. In fact, on February 14th of 2020, US stocks hit an all-time high. You're saying, weren't they worried about the virus? Until February 14th, we thought the virus was gonna be restricted to China and cruise ships. Remember all the news stories, until then every person had COVID had either been to China or had been on a cruise ship. 
He said, what happened on February 14th? On February 14th, the Italian government announced they'd found 200 COVID cases in mainland Italy and none of them had been in China on a cruise ship. And we all woke up to, oh my God, this is a virus that's going to envelop the world. And markets reacted. And in the next few weeks, between February 14th and March 23rd, the best word I can describe for what equities did was they melted down. Melted down how much? Stocks were, the S&P 500 was down almost 34%. The NASDAQ was down almost 30%. That's a full-fledged bear market in six weeks. If you get a chance, go and look at the newspapers on, or the newspaper headlines. You can, do, you can find it digitally. On March 23rd, the world was ending. Stocks had basically fallen through the floor. But remember I said, markets are a pricing game. For whatever reason, on March 24th, markets woke up in a good mood. Don't ask me why, maybe I can give you some reasons. And then, then over the next few months, from March 23rd through September 1st, stocks kept going up and up and up. How much? The S&P 500 rose 56%. It basically made back everything it had lost in the first five weeks. And so did the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ went up even more. So you had a meltdown and then you had a meltdown. So September, by September 1st, your reaction was what crisis? And then between September 1st and November 1st, <clears throat> Stocks recalibrated. Notice I haven't brought in the last week with the vaccine because we created a new dynamic in here. But between September 1st, and what do I mean by recalibrated? You markets had big up days followed by big down days, big up weeks followed by down weeks. It's almost like the market was trying to find a steady state. Meltdown, melt up, recalibration. And while this was happening in US equities, you were seeing this play out in pretty much every market in the world. In fact, since you're in Brazil, you can focus on the Bovespa. The Bovespa was down 41% between March to, uh, to February 14th and March 20th. So just like the US, Brazilian equities were down. Between March 20th and November 1st, the Bovespa was up 36%. Same kind of phenomenon. But if you look at the overall returns, the Bovespa is still down, whereas the S&P 500 and global equities are pretty close to where they were before. These are all in local currencies. We'll come back and talk more about what might be going on. But if you look across markets, they all have the same kind of pattern, right? Big, bad first five weeks, recovery in the next few months, recalibration. This was a crisis that was global. And as in 2008, we realized how closely connected equity markets were around the globe. Now, as stocks were melting down between February 14th and March 20th, people were panicking. They were selling risky assets. And when people panic, you know what they do, right? They look for safety. And for better or worse, in the last few decades, where they often have gone is US Treasury. So they're taking money out of stocks, investing in, in treasuries. What does that do? It pushes up the price of treasuries. It pushes down the yield. And in the first few weeks of this crisis, you can see US Treasury yields all dropping, 30-year, 20-year, 10-year, T-bill. The T-bill rate dropped close to zero. The 10-year rate went from 1.7 to 0.7%. Basically, Treasury rates collapsed because people were buying Treasuries. Now, the easy answer people give is the Fed did. You know, the Fed did not open its mouth till March 15th, and by then, rates had already dropped. And when the Fed did open its mouth and said they were going to continue with quantitative easing, market said, we don't care. In fact, it was the second Fed announcement that I think was more consequential. Eight days later, on March 23rd, the Fed said, in addition to quantitative easing, we're going to be a backstop in the private lending markets. You know what they were talking about, right? Lending to trouble companies, buying below investment grade bonds, something they did not do in 2008. They said they would do on March, on March 23rd. To be honest, the Fed actually hasn't spent much money as a backstop. It's actually spent nothing. But that announcement, for whatever reason, changed every other market, but not the treasury market. The treasury market, rates have stayed low. So what's happened in the treasury market is in the first few weeks, treasury rates dropped, but they've stayed low. Now, as people panicked in equity markets, they were also panicking in the bond markets. These are corporate bond spreads. So the way to read this is take a triple B rated bond, investment grade, on February 14th, the spread on that bond, this is what you would charge over and above the T-bond was 1.33%. 1 
on March 23rd was 3.73%. It had almost tripled. That's almost unheard of. Even in 2008, spreads didn't widen that much. But look at what's happened by November 1st. It's back down almost to where it was before the crisis. You see the same story playing out. Panic in the first few weeks, come back over the next few months. And that's been true across the ratings classes. Now, as all of these markets were moving, I was keeping track of two commodities. One was, go one, one, was one was oil and the other was copper. You see, why those two? Very simply put, these are two economically sensitive commodities and you would expect them to react to the shutting down of the global economy. They did in the first few weeks. Between February 14th and March 23rd, by now I sound like a broken record. You know what copper prices did? They dropped about 15.4%. That's a pretty hefty drop. But take a look at what oil prices did. In fact, I tracked two oil prices here. Brent crude, which is global oil, and West Texas crude, which is US oil, dropped more than 50%. You know what that tells me? There's something else going on in the oil, in the oil market that's not just COVID. That's in the first few weeks. Since then, what's happened? Copper has completely recovered. In fact, by the time you get to November 1st, copper is now 17% higher than it was on February 14th. Oil is still down more than 30%, but it's, down, it's, it's improved from how badly it was beaten up on March 23rd. And there was one day, April 19th, where I saw something I, I, I never thought I would see. You know how much a barrel a West Texas crude traded for in April 19, 2020? Minus $40. You didn't mishear me. Minus $40. What does that mean? If you are trying to sell a barrel of oil on April, April 19th, you would have had to pay somebody almost $40 to take it off your hands. You see, why? We were running out of storage capacity in the US. So if you bought oil, where were you going to park it? And finally, I looked at two other investments, gold and Bitcoin. Strange pairing, but you can see why I looked at gold, right? Gold has been a crisis asset of long standing. Whenever people have panicked, they bought gold. And during this crisis, it's played that role really well. Look at how well it held up when stock, it was the only asset class in those first few weeks when everything else was melting down, which actually held its value. And over the crisis, gold is up about 19%. But I've paired it with Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin has been described by some of its advocates, people who like it, as millennial gold, which is, hey, if you're 35 years old and you panic, you're not going to buy gold. That's for your parents and grandparents. You're going to buy Bitcoin. So I wanted to see, did Bitcoin behave like a crisis asset? Well, in this first few weeks, remember when stocks were melting down? You know what Bitcoin did? It melted down as well, even more than stocks, almost down almost 40%. In the months since, while stocks were going up, you know what Bitcoin did? It went up more than stocks. And it's not just Bitcoin, Ethereum did the same thing. Cryptos during this crisis have not behaved like crisis assets. They behave like very risky equities. That's not, so it's not a critique. I'm just saying you have to take that into account. Which brings me to a breakdown of how equities have played out. One of the things I've been doing every week is downloading the market cap of every publicly traded company in the world. I have access to S&P Capital IQ, so I can do this. And then I look at the cumulative effect broken down by grouping. Like what? Like regions. These are all in US dollar terms. So keep that in mind when you look at how this crisis has played out in different markets. In the last column, you see the total effect of the crisis. In all of the markets, you saw the same kind of phenomenon play out, which is what? Stocks collapsing between February 14th and March 23rd, and then recovering in the months since. But how much they've recovered varies across markets. If you take Africa, for instance, if you look at the total return over the, over the eight months since February 14th, they're down about 18%. In fact, here are the three worst hit regions of the world with the most negative returns over these eight months. One is Africa. Two is Eastern Europe and Russia. Three is Latin America. What do they share in common? Your first reaction is they're all emerging markets. Hey, that's too easy. So is Asia. And Asia has been the best performing region in the world. It just can't be. It can't just be that they're emerging markets. You know what I think these three regions share in common? Africa, Eastern Europe, and Russia. 
Latin America, they are overly dependent on natural resource companies. Think of Chile, right? How dependent it is on copper. They're overly dependent on natural resource companies. And they also are overly dependent on big infrastructure companies. You're saying what? So, so what? Well, as you see in the next page, one of the worsted sectors is capital intensive businesses, big infrastructure businesses. But before I show you the next page, the worst hit developed market has been the UK. Brexit is playing a role there. But if you look across the world, you can see that this is a crisis that's had a very disparate impact across the world. If you break down the impact by sector, remember again, I'm at 44,000 companies in my sample. I'm looking at the total percentage change in market cap by sector. You know, the best performing sector since February 14th has been? It's consumer discretionary. It's strange, right? In the middle of a crisis, people are still buying things. Next best is technology. Third best is healthcare. You see why I described this as the most orderly crisis ever? What are the worst hit? One is energy. No surprise there. Oil prices are down. The second is utilities, and the third is real estate. I think real estate is in for a reckoning in this crisis. They're all capital intensive businesses, but I don't think it's a capital intensity per se that is getting them into trouble. It's how they fund that capital. You know what I'm talking about? What do these companies tend to overuse? They all tend to use more debt than other companies. And as, we, as we've seen a few pages, that's been deadly. If you want to break the sectors down by industry, it actually makes sense that 10 best performing industries all turn out to be capital intensive businesses or financial service companies. In fact, I forgot to mention that among the worst performing sectors was financial services. You see, why is it in there with the capital intensive businesses? Because when the oil companies and the utilities are unable to make their debt payments, guess who's left holding the bag? Banks are described as living in reflected glory and reflected pain. And right now there's a lot of reflected pain. When you look at the worst performing industries, a lot of capital intensive, a lot of financials. When you look at the best performing, a lot of capital light businesses, software, so online retail. Which brings me to a sum up on markets. It's been volatile, but it's a reflection of the uncertainty we all feel. So I'm not going to pick on markets for being volatile. I think it's been incredibly orderly. There have been very few days in this market where people are selling everything, which you get in most crises. And finally, I'm glad people did not listen to some of the people who suggested earlier and we shut markets down till the virus passes. Thank God we didn't allow that to happen. I believe that during crisis, the worst thing you can do is shut markets down. Liquidity is a salve during crisis. Which brings me to my second lesson. In every crisis, you have people with agendas who come out of the woodwork. You know what I'm talking about? These are people who want to push something. They've been trying to push this for decades and they use every crisis as an opportunity to say, I told you so. And I'll talk about two groups that were very vocal early in the crisis about what, why this was vindication for what they'd been pushing. The first is old time value investors. You know who I'm talking about? Some of you are probably in this group. You read Ben Graham's security analysis. You probably travel to Omaha once every year. You worship at the ultra Warren Buffett. And you think the answer to every problem is to buy low PE stocks with high dividends. The other group that was very vocal early on was stock, people in the US who never liked buybacks. They feel that buybacks are the ultimate corporate sin and it's because of buybacks that companies get into trouble. So the first two weeks of this crisis, old time value investors came out of the woodwork saying, I told you so. And you know why they were so vocal and so aggressive? Because they've had a really tough decade. And let me explain. For much of the 20th century, value investing beat growth investing, right? If you define value investing as buying low PE and low price to book stocks, they clearly outperformed high price earnings and high price, price to book stocks. No longer. In fact, in the last decade, 2010 to 19, take a look at what, what, what's happened. High PE and high price to book stocks have significantly outperformed low PE and low price to book stocks. Value investors have been wandering in the wilderness for a decade, including some really big names. Let's face it, Warren Buffett has been a below average investor for the last 10 years and a barely average investor for the last 20. I'm not saying he wasn't a great investor before that, 
but he's had a tough 20 years and a really bad 10 years. And during those 10 years, what value investors told me is just wait, wait for a crisis. And then you're going to see how much our advice matters, how much it's, it's useful to buy low P stocks with high dividends during a crisis. So I said, okay, you've got your chance. Let's see how you've done. What, I, what you have in this page is a breakdown of companies based on PE on February 14th, from lowest PE to highest PE. Take a look at the last column. Who are the winners and who are the losers? The lowest PE stocks are the ones that have lost money during this crisis. The highest PE stocks are the ones that have performed the best. If you break down stocks based on dividend yield, stocks that pay no dividends or very little in dividends have done much better than stocks that pay high dividends. Put simply, if you listen to value investing advice and bought low PE stocks, with high dividends, not only did they have a bad decade over the last decade, but the last eight months have been even more punishment. When you break stocks based on momentum, remember this is the ultimate sin in value investing is to buy a stock just because it's gone up. During this crisis, the highest momentum stocks are the only ones that have done really well. The lower momentum stocks have been punished. Value investing has not worked. In fact, the only piece of advice in value investing that seems to have some semblance of working is debt. During this crisis, companies with very little debt, so basically I'm measuring debt as net debt to EBITDA, have done much better than companies with a lot more debt. Latin America has a problem. Many companies choose to borrow money. Don't tell me you're forced to borrow money. Choose to borrow money. Why? Because they value control. Let's face it, many Latin American companies value control more than sanity. And the consequence, you know, I, this crisis has been tough on Latin America. So what's the bottom line in value versus growth? This crisis, if it was supposed to be the one that showed me value investing worked, hasn't. It's failed the test. And deservedly so, because I have believed for a long time that value investing, at least as practiced today, has lost its way. It's become rigid. All these rules, I have no idea where they come from, right? There are some value investors, I'll never invest in a tech stock. How stupid is that? It's become, you know, it's, it's become ritualistic. There are all these things you're supposed to do as a value investor, and I refuse to do them. And it's very righteous. There's nobody more infuriating than an old-time value investor who wags his finger and says, I told you so. Is there hope? Yes. But we have to rediscover the word value. Nothing in value investing, the way I describe, my definition of value investing is you will buy a stock if the price is less than the value. I'd be willing to buy, I mean, that's the philosophy that led me to buy Uber in 2019. What old time value investor would buy a Tesla in June of 2019 or Uber in September of 2020? Talking about life cycles, where value investors stay with mature companies, think about companies going through a life cycle, young to old. Young companies, startups, then you have you know, very young companies that become mature, middle age, old age, die. Morbid thought, but companies move through a life cycle. And during most crises, young companies get punished more than old companies. Go back and look at 2008 and 1992. In most crises, young companies get punished, but not in this one. In this crisis, I break down companies by age. The youngest companies have done really well. And the oldest companies have done badly. It's almost ironic, right? Because the virus itself is most dangerous for old people. And in the market, it's the oldest companies that have suffered. And if you break companies down based on growth, highest growth companies have done much better than the lowest growth companies. I'm using revenue growth. And if I focus on just six companies, remember six out of 44,000, six companies, but these six companies, if I name them, you'll see why I focus on the six. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And if on top of that, I add Apple and Microsoft. These six companies accounted for 15% of the increase in market value of all US stocks in the last decade. During this crisis, they've done even better. Their collective market values increased by about 1.2 trillion. In fact, without those six stocks, take a look at how much US equities would have done. They'd have been down like Latin America, perhaps not as much, but now, you wouldn't have seen the returns you're seeing for U.S. equities if you took these six stocks out. 
And it kind of makes sense, right? Because think of what this crisis has done. It's made all six companies stronger because we're spending more time in the Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Google ecosystems than ever before because they're all trapped at home. So I've wondered what's different about this crisis that's led to this. And you could argue one of it is the origins of this crisis. Most crises, markets melt down first and then the economy follows. This crisis, the markets are actually doing really well. The economy shut down first and the markets follow. And there was a time that said in six, the, the time was a complete lie, but we believed them in six months, you'll all be back out there and we believe them. But the biggest change here is how private risk capitalists behave during this crisis. You know what I mean by private risk capital? Private risk capital is capital invest in the riskiest parts of the market, venture capital, investments in risky companies, IPOs. And during most crises, private risk capital flees the game. But in this crisis, take a look at what venture capital did in the first three quarters of 2020. It's kind of held up. Even in the worst days of this crisis, VCs have continued to invest money. Usually when you look at IPOs, IPOs stop during a crisis. In this crisis, in the third quarter of 2020, more IPOs were created in the US than in any quarter in history. You had an all time high. And the way this shows up in is in a number that I track on a daily basis during crisis. Some of you might be familiar with the way I compute equity risk premiums, a forward-looking implied premium, which I do for the S&P 500. Usually I do it only once a month, but during a crisis, I do it daily. This is the price of risk in the equity market over the last eight months. And take a look at what's happened. In the first few weeks, between February 14th and March 23rd, when people are panicking, the price of risk grows. Makes sense, right? And then as you go through, take a look at what's happened since. The equity risk premium at the start of November was back to where it was before the crisis. This wasn't the case in 2008. Price of risk in the equity market has dropped back to pre-crisis levels. And because my country risk premiums, which some of you might download from my data sets, are built off my US premium and are also dependent on the default spreads for countries, this year I had to, usually I update these premiums twice a year, once at the start and once in the middle. This year I did an April 1st update. So let's focus on Brazil. Let's see how Brazil has looked in terms of an equity risk premium during the course of the year. At the start of the year, the equity risk premium I estimated for Brazil was 8.16%, building off a US premium of 5.2% and reflecting the low sovereign default spread set. Three months later, take a look at Brazil. My equity risk premium for Brazil has jumped to 11.5, building off a bigger base and much larger sovereign default spreads. By Ju July 1st, though, it had dropped back to 9.64%. This has been an extraordinarily volatile year for equity risk premiums because the price of risk has changed so dramatically over short periods. Let's talk about the third lesson. During every crisis, you will, you know, you'll be told about you no know, that that there's. I mean, even before crisis, there's this is mythology of smart of smart money and stupid money. You know what smart money does? It gets into markets at the right time. It buys the right stocks and stupid money gets in at the wrong time, buys all the wrong stocks. Smart money is intellectual. It's well-read. Stupid money is emotional. And usually in the saying, in this, at least the saying of this story, here's what it looks like. Smart money is portfolio managers and hedge fund managers and stupid money is retail investors. When I first came into markets, that's the story I was told. That was in the 1980s. And for 35 years, I've been looking for smart money and I haven't found it. But there's actually a very simple context between smart and stupid money that's been happening for decades now, which at least in the last 10 years, stupid money has won decisively. You know where it plays out? Remember, you have two choices as an investor. You can invest through these smart money managers. You can pay them a fee, hedge funds, put for, or you can put your money in index funds. It's passive versus active. And the last decade, guess which one's been winning? Passive investing has beating, been beating the pants out of active investing because active investors have not delivered returns that match what passive investors make. And during this period, you know what active investors told me? Hedge fund and portfolio managers? They said, just wait for a crisis. Then you're going to see how much you need our smartness. Well, they have, you have, the, they have the chance now. If you look at what mutual funds have done during this crisis, 
74% of actively run mutual funds have underperformed the index by about three to 5%. If this was the crisis you were supposed to shine in, clearly hasn't happened. What about hedge funds? Just as bad. You know, the alpha, hedge fund managers love to talk about the alpha. The alpha has been minus one to minus 1.5% during this crisis. And during the last few months has been this very embarrassing contest that's been played out where Barron's and Goldman Sachs have been comparing the stock picks made by the top hedge fund managers versus the stock picks made on this uh, online brokerage service called Robinhood. Robinhood is an online brokerage service that attracted a very special group of first time investors. These people used to bet on sports until last year, but because there were no sports, they decided to bet on stocks. They're open about the fact that they don't know nothing about stocks, but they pick stocks anyway. And you know what's happened in the last few months? The Robinhood app investors have beaten hedge funds by about 16%. That's kind of scary. So if you ask me to classify investors, I don't believe there's such a thing as smart money or stupid money. I think there's money that thinks it's smart, but it's really not that smart. I would suggest we decide, we break money, manage down into humble money and arrogant money. What does arrogant money do? It believes that every win is because of its skill and every loss is somebody else's fault. Humble money says every win and knows how much luck played a role and says, okay, no, I got lucky. And every loss, it looks at what did I do wrong? If you're going to entrust your money with somebody, give it to humble money. We have only a few more minutes, so let me kind of uh, start wrapping up. Now, during every crisis, you're told the fundamentals don't matter. In the start of every year, for the last 35 years, I valued the S&P 500. Not, not a big deal. I take expected cash flows that you get from dividends and buybacks and discount them back at a required return to come up with an intrinsic value of the index. And when this crisis hit, I was told that none of those things would work. And there are two things, two levels at which people are puzzled by markets. The first is, how can markets be going up when the economy is doing so badly? You've heard that, right? How can markets be going up? I'm going to give you a very simple answer soon. The second is, are markets in denial? Don't they see how much damage COVID is doing to the economy and stocks? To answer the first question, I did a graph where I graphed out returns in, in, on stocks every quarter going back to 1960 versus change in real GDP every quarter. So think of that as what the economy is doing. And then it had a correlation between what stocks were doing in a quarter and what the GDP was doing in the same quarter. You know what the correlation was? Close to zero. There's almost no relationship. In fact, slightly negative. There's almost no relationship between what stocks do in a quarter and what the economy is doing contemporaneously. You're saying, that's crazy. Is it? What's, what's a market's job? It's not to tell you what's happening right now, but to try to forecast the future. And as you go forward, notice the correlations start to become positive. The way I describe the stock market is it's a predictor of the future, but it's a noisy predictor. It's wrong a lot of the time because that correlation, while it climbs, you know, it's not climbing to 90%, it's climbing to 25 or 30%. Now, in terms of explaining why the market is doing what it is, I decided to do an intrinsic valuation of the market. This was on November 1st, a week ago. I said, is the market crazy? Because that's what I keep hearing. So I brought in what people are expecting the crisis will do to earnings in the near term. And it's going to be damaging. Earnings are going to drop in 2020 and 2021. And I brought in that drop. I do believe that some of this drop is permanent. Those cruise line earnings are never coming back. I also believe that dividends will, be, will drop by about 20% and buybacks will drop 50% in 2020 and there'll be residual effects in future years. And finally, I updated my risk-free rate and risk premium. With those assumptions, I valued the index on November 1st at about 3,100. Market's trading at 3,270. Hey, you know what? You could say, well, market's overvalued and probably is, but it's not crazy overvalued. In fact, the market, I could argue there's a, there's a plausible story I could tell to explain where markets are right now. So when people say markets have gone crazy, you can't explain them, you haven't tried hard enough. And finally, one of my favorite tools is a Monte Carlo simulation. So I took my S&P 500 valuation, made my key inputs on earnings and cash flows into distributions and came up with the distribution of values of the index. My median value is 3,100, roughly what I got with my base case, but take a look at that spread. 
Don't be so quick to call people crazy or call markets crazy just because you don't like the level the market is trading at. Which brings me to my final lesson. Now, I've always been a believer that a good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. And this is the session I did for you when I was in Brazil in 2017. So we get a chance to go back and watch that video of that session where I talk about connecting stories to numbers. And I talk about a five-step process, starting with telling a story, checking to make sure the story is possible, plausible, and probable, right? Three, three P tests converting the story into valuation inputs, coming up with a valuation, and then listening to people who disagree with you to make your valuation better. I call this keeping the feedback loop open. In fact, this is exactly the process I used to value Tesla at the start of this year, where I told a big story for Tesla. How big? I'm making Tesla as big as Ford in 10 years, giving it margins like a technology company and letting it reinvest like no manufacturing company has his historically. That's a lot of good stuff, right? The value that I got with that good stuff was $427. Incidentally, I'd bought Tesla seven months before this valuation when its stock price was 180 and I had to sell it right after this valuation. I left a lot of money on the table. And then the crisis said, and I was told you can't do that stuff anymore. What absolute nonsense. During a crisis is when you have to go back to basics. And in fact, I'm gonna suggest three steps. If you're sitting down to value a company that will bring you back to sanity. Remember that you still need to tell stories. And this crisis has made some companies' stories much bigger. They're going to be worth more because of this crisis. Let me give you an obvious example. We're on its platform, Zoom. This is a company whose values increase clearly because of the crisis. A company like Moderna is the right place at the right time with its vaccine. Values increase. Or your value could have increased, like, and I think Tesla is, is in this bucket, because your competition has been hurt so badly. Think of Tesla's traditional competition, Volkswagen, Ford, GM, they're all handicapped by the crisis. Your stories can contract. Why? Because your markets got smaller. Every cruise line company is going to be worth less now than it was before, because even if the virus passes, people are not coming back. Or it could be because you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Commodity companies, their values are down through no fault of their own. And with every one of these companies, the risk of failure has become real and imminent. So here's my three-step process for valuing companies now. I start by assessing the short-term effects, whatever the company is. What, what will it do to 2020 and 2021 earnings? For Zoom, the earnings might dramatically jump. For Boeing, they might drop. Second, I revisit my story and ask, how will this crisis affect my story? And third, I think about what is the chance my company will not make it through the next three years? So if you get a chance, go on YouTube. I created an Excel spreadsheet that essentially lets you do this. Look at the near-term effects, look at the long-term story, bring in the upgrade, updated risk premiums, and then build in a failure probability. And in fact, I used it to value Tesla. And as you can see, this was seven months after my, the valuation I showed you. Much bigger story. I now think Tesla is going to have revenues as close to Daimler. This crisis has so damaged traditional auto companies, bigger revenues. Margins have become a little more so, but this crisis kind of reminded me I shouldn't overshoot on margins. The value that I get is $624, $200 per share higher than seven months ago. Of course, all of this was before a five for one stock split, so be careful and don't compare to the stock price today. I valued Zoom, a company I valued in February, I valued it again, you know, in July. And you can see, you know, seven months later, how much higher the value is because the market has gotten bigger. And finally, I, I valued Boeing. And this was a valuation I did at the depths of the crisis. Now, and I told a pretty negative story of, you know, continued losses and big dramatic, you know, the chance that the Boeing would not make it. The point I'm trying to make is don't abandon everything, you know, about valuation, but don't value companies mechanically. You need to tell stories. You need to think about how those stories play out. And if you get a chance, go to my, you know, go to my 12th post from my blog or the 13th post where I looked at the FANG stocks plus Apple and Microsoft, and I valued each of them. So if I were to summarize what this crisis has done, it's, it's, it's humbling to always go through a crisis because you realize how much you don't know. But don't abandon what you know in a hurry because it might still hold. You just have to be more adaptable. So I'm going to end my show. So if you have any, so if you have any questions, you can actually put up your, your hand. I will call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask the question because I think that's the most convenient way to do it. Hello, can you hear me, Professor? I can hear you well. 
Yep. Great, good. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, so I've, uh, I have a question here and I'd like to, to hear your opinion about it is, uh, we have seen a super high valuation gap that has accelerated over the last 12 months between value and growth stocks. And I would like to, to know uh, well, what do you think, what do you well, think in your opinion to make this? Yeah, it's, it's not just the last eight months, it's been last 11 years. So at some point in time, I think value investors need to ask themselves, is there something wrong with this? For too long, you know the excuse I hear from value investors? It's just a passing phase. Well, how long does a passing phase last? So that's why I, you know, I, the way I conclude with value investing is, I think value investing is in trouble. And I'll tell you why it's in trouble. You know, not could like it. It's lazy and sloppy. Value investing as practice now doesn't deserve to make money. It's become extremely lazy, extremely rigid, extremely sloppy. You know, most value investors don't really, couldn't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. Their idea of value investing is pick stocks with low PE ratios and you know, low volatility. This is not value investing. So have value stocks underperformed? Yeah, I think this is a crisis that is essentially said, just because a stock has a low PE ratio or pays high dividends doesn't make it a value stock. If, that, if this crisis doesn't bring that home, nothing will. So if you're waiting for the return of value investing, maybe you'll be waiting a really long time. Maybe you need to rethink what value investing really is and think about how we approach value and value investing for us to find a way out of this. Okay, Odessia. Uh, oh, good afternoon, Professor Damodaran. Um, just continue on Rafael's question. Yep. Um, just by hearing you, I remembered one sentence from Howard Marks in his book that he says that the difference between value investors and growth investors is that value investors, they just put value today and growth investors look for value in the future. Exactly. And that's the relation that we have now, right? Well, I think that's, that's partially true, right? And in fact, that's a good way to differentiate between value investors and growth investors. In fact, what I... What I, the way I do it is I do it to the financial balance sheet. And they say value investors believe that markets make mistakes on existing investments. Growth investors believe that markets make mistakes on growth assets. They both care about value, right? They both want to buy something, but the question is, what are they valuing? So that's a good description, but it also means that what are the types of companies value investors are gonna end up investing in? If you buy into that definition, you think about the life cycle of companies, are you going to be investing in any growth companies? Yeah, that's uh, that's the main issue because right now, when the my, my my main question here, and I think just a couple of weeks ago, CFA Institute just sent us an email about our opinions about goodwill, and how analysts can use that information in order to value companies. Um, or, I mean, that, that's a very just right now. question, right? Just ignore it. But goodwill is the most, why are you even looking at a balance sheet if you're valuing companies? That I think is at the core of value investing's problem. Your two balance sheet, I'm not picking on you, but I'm saying value investing is too focused on balance sheets and book value. Just let it go. And how it's to- It's not going to work. It's never going to work because accounting is not a good arbiter of what something is worth. And book values lost all meaning. In fact, of all of the three financial statements, the balance sheet is the least useful. In fact, there are only two items in the balance sheet worth looking at, cash and debt. The rest is, a, is complete nonsense with all this fair value accounting. I, you know, the rest is just pure crap. And as long as value investing is resting on that balance sheet, it is never going to find its way out of the hole it's in. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Marcel had a question about which US sectors would be better off once the pandemic goes away. 
Well, I think you're starting to see the market is already sending a signal of what this, the, I think that the market is already forecasting the future. It doesn't see much hope in energy or utilities. It's not like these are going to come back once the crisis is over. So if you're hoping for some kind of recovery play in these sectors, you might be waiting a long time. Even airlines, I don't think are gonna come fully back because there are many people who will never fly again. In fact, I think the demand for airline travel especially from businesses, is going to drop dramatically after this. Real estate, I'll tell you this morning, I, I was talking to somebody this morning, in fact, to the CFA in the US yesterday. And, I, and somebody asked me about commercial real estate. And I said, commercial real estate to me is the sector that terrifies me the most. Because I don't think that, I mean, when I look at the future of commercial real estate, I just get down and say, thank you, God, for not making me an investor in commercial real estate, because I really don't see a way out of this. Yeah. Letitia asked me for, uh, what about Graham's advice and IPOs? Is, are people still reading Ben Graham? I mean, come on, the, the man, the, that book was what, eight, 90 years. I, I, you know what? I read Security Analysis a long time ago. There's something useful in that book, a philosophy. Most of the book, though, reflects not just 20th century, almost 19th century thinking about investing. If your investing today is driven by Ben Graham security analysis, I mean, I, I, I have serious doubts about where the end game is going to be. Jose you know, asked about the big reset idea where countries don't pay debts. That's such a nice end game for Argentina. And, and I guess any indebted country, it's a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a pipe dream. It's a pipe dream because you do that, you think the companies or countries are not going to go back to borrow money. In fact, you've said the worst kind of incentive signal by doing it because you've told company, countries go out and borrow more. 20 years from now, we'll do another big reset again. So I, don't, I hope that big reset idea dies very quickly. This is the kind of idea that comes out of Davos because terrible ideas come out of that place. If I had my brothers, I'd blow that place up and never have another Davos meeting again where all these elitists get together and talk to each other about what to do. Now, I think it's a terrible idea. I don't think it should be done. Go ahead, Anderson. Okay, thanks, Professor. Uh, thanks for your time and your excellent material that you share with us currently on your website and here now today. And I want your opinion about two, two subjects. And the first is about the US, US dollar yeah. and thinking globally and what's the, you think a really long time uh, strange of the dollar and the US dollar have not been the, the, the main currency of the world for the whole history you have. Less at, least, at, least since, at least since the Second World War. Before that, it was the British pound. So I mean, yeah. it's, you know, currencies yeah. go through cycles. Yeah. Do you think we we are we are next near near to a to a to a change in in the this? Right. Let me ask you a question: Which currency are you going to change it to? Certainly not the Chinese yuan. Nobody okay. trusts the Chinese government further than you can throw it. The euro was the most obvious alternative. But let's face it, the EU is a dead man walking. I mean, if you talk about regions of the world, when you talk about the future, Europe is a problem. It's got an aging population. And it's, um, you know, that's what you see. With, when you see negative risk-free rates in a currency, you know what it tells you about the future? Nothing yes. good. Nothing good. Deflation, low growth. So I think the US dollar is blessed, at least for the moment, by the fact that its competition looks so crappy. In fact, the dollar has become even more prominent as the world currency of choice during these last eight months. Could a cryptocurrency replace the dollar? Yes, but it's definitely not going to be one of the cryptos that are out there right now, because the cryptos that are out, out there right now are all you know, borderline insane. The, I mean, if you are designing a bad currency, you look like the Bitcoin, right? Who designs a currency and puts an absolute limit on how many, you know, how much currency you're going to have? 21 million Bitcoin. Completely made up. It was designed in paranoia. Because remember, Bitcoin was designed in 2008 and you know, right after the crisis. And it reflects that paranoia, trusting no one. So for the moment, I think you're stuck with the US dollar. What is the okay. second question? Yeah, yeah, maybe about, uh, we have seen some, and 
really great dividend yields on the US market, maybe. And like AT&T, maybe McDonald's yielding. So you know what? You, have you heard of a value traps? Yeah, I, I, that's strategy what strategy around high dividend yield stocks now. I yeah. think you're at just begging for disaster. Yeah, maybe we have some like, dividend yields attracted. Okay. But because it, when you get really high dividend yields, four, five, six percent, you're getting dual signals, right? The dividends say, look, lots of cash flows. The market saying this company's in trouble. And given a choice between those two signals, I'm going to trust the market almost every single time. And that's why if you look at that table on high dividend yield stocks, they've been among the worst performers during this crisis. So if you want big cash flows, and I tell people this and they take it badly, I said, just go buy bonds. If you're in the equity market with given risk-free rates now, don't ask me for three, four, five percent dividend deals in dollar terms. It's not going to be sustainable. And the stocks that pay that have something deeply wrong with them. That's just it's a matter of time before they blow up. No. Okay, thank you very much. Juliana asked me, asked me a question about what I thought about China 2021 to 2030. Let's face it, China is now the second largest economy in the world. It's getting close to a mature economy. You know what rates mature economies grow at? 3%, 4%, maybe 5 The days of double-digit growth in China are done. You can't go back there. There's not enough growth in the world to sustain it. The growth in China is going to be 3 4 5%. The Chinese government might hide this and provide you with statistics that suggest it's 8 9 or 10 Don't believe it. China is now a good economy, but it's too big an economy to deliver the growth rate you saw a decade ago or 20 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Marcel asked a question about, uh, are we on the cusp towards clean energy? I don't know whether we're on the cusp towards clean energy, but clearly the market's turned away from fossil fuel companies, right? Because if you look at energy companies collectively in the S&P 500, they've dropped in value almost 50% in the last 10 years. The market's already made its mind up. It's saying, look, the end game for fossil fuel is being played out. It's not like we're going to stop using oil in 2022. We can't sustain that but they, we will use less oil in the future. It's pricing oil companies accordingly. Royal Dutch, Exxon Mobil, Aramco. And I think that that's the answer. Whether, it's a, you know, whether the shift is to clean energy, we don't know yet because the winners in the green energy game have not been picked. But fossil fuels have been tagged the loser. Andre? Yes, how are you? Uh, the Hi, Andre, uh, how are you? Very good. Uh, Demandran, I have a question on the, on the valuation of the markets. Um, yeah. How do you take into account the fact that the governments have uh, issued, uh, like say, a lot of debt, they're giving away a lot of money and uh, increasing their debt. Um, don't you think there's a risk that uh, in the future, the governments may have to raise taxes and then the, also that's the interest rate, which is uh, very low for historic standards or whatever, yeah. uh, may go up and then uh, may hurt. There, the is, there is a plausible story that you can tell. That is what I call my catastrophe story. And you're getting very close to the catastrophe story. You know how the catastrophe story plays out? The US government issues, you know, raises three trillion, the European, every, everybody's doing this, right? They're borrowing money, they're printing money like it's going out of style. And the catastrophe story, you know what happens because of all this money being printed? You can't raise taxes enough to cover that. People, you know, inflation goes up, and inflation goes up, interest rates will go up. You can't keep them down, and in, in interest rates go up. All financial assets are going to implode. So in the catastrophe story, there is no safe place to go in the world. You can't invest in stocks. You can't invest in bonds. You can't invest in pretty much any financial asset. You're saying, what do I invest in? You'll have to invest in gold and collectibles and... Put your head down and wait for the dark days to pass. And there are a few people who've gone down that road, road, right? The only problem is you could have told the same story in 2009. And there were people who listened to the story, sold all their financial assets and bought physical assets and gold in 2010 and stayed out of stocks from 2010 through 2020. I don't know how they feel right now, but think of how much money they left on the table. So there is a story of catastrophe. And my suggestion to investors is don't go all in on that story, but build yourself some protection. 
in your portfolio against that happening. You know, how you do, you cannot do it completely. You will not get full protection, but you get at least partial protection. Some of your money should be in collectibles and real assets more maybe than 30 or 40 years ago, because there is a chance. And I think you're making that point that, that this could end very badly if inflation and interest rates shoot up through the roof. I mean, you're in Brazil, you think about 1991, right? And if you think about the entire global economy going through 1991, I don't know how you survived that holding financial assets. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Uh, professor, uh, good evening. Uh, how do you incorporate in your, in your valuation stories the chance that we might be overreacting to long-term trends? For instance, uh, if you think about the New York uh, metro system, yeah. uh, is it really going to change that much? Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts about this? Because especially here in Brazil, trying to, to think about this locally, we still have a pretty poor population. Uh, the trends might differ a little bit from the US, but overall- But I give mean, me an uh, example of overreaction because we're talking about a market overreaction. So, because- Yeah, I mean- Expert it, it, overreaction, it, 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 I don't care about. Experts overreact to everything. I don't even listen to them. But give me an example of a market seem to overreact. For they instance, Zoom, Zoom is going to uh, decrease airlines' yeah, it, uh, I, I, business okay, trips. Good. Yeah, I think you raised a good point. I do think Zoom and Moderna and Peloton are now overpriced. Why? Because people have taken a trend and they've become too optimistic about what that trend will deliver. So on that point, you're right. On the other side, are airlines being punished too much? I don't think so. I actually, the markets behave pretty well with the uh, downside. And I think it's on the upside, especially with these companies that are in the news that you read about every day. And that's why you pick Zoom and Peloton and Moderna as my examples. I do think you're right. Markets have become a little too upbeat about their future. And that's why I don't know my valuation of Zoom. I, I tripled their value from where it was just six months ago, but the stock price is up eight times. So I think you have a good point on that. Okay, so th th that's not something that you can tackle on Monte Carlo or something. Uh, this is like an option that may or may not play out, right? Yeah. Th this is a tough question, I guess. Okay. Yeah, in fact, uh, Monte Carlo simulation is a good way. You know where you see it in the tails of the distribution. You're valuing these companies the 80th and the 90th percentile rather than the 50th percentile. Okay, thank you. And Jonathan makes a point about current models. There's nothing in current models that prevents you from being creative and dynamic. You know what the problem with current models is? We, we build in these static constraints that get us into trouble. So Jonathan, the problem is not with the models, it's with us. The DCF model is incredibly flexible. You can take uh, Kathy Wood from ARC and you can take whatever a story is and make it into a DCF model. So don't blame the model, blame the person who builds the model and uses it. Gustavo, are we going to end up or end the class, a session or are we, uh, good? I'm, I don't mind keeping it open a few more minutes. Well, we have, uh, Professor, we have three more questions from Flavia, okay. Victor Absolutely. and Joan. If we can get sure. those done and then we can yeah. finish the event. Thank you. Absolutely. Flavia, go ahead. Hi, hi, thank you very much. I was your student many, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you get as old as me, I, you know, I, I get, I've, I have students who have children who are my students now. I'm getting really <laughs> old now, so. I know. One of the questions that I have is uh, what we see in Brazil, a lot of new investors to the stock market as well. And, but when you talk up with these new investors, they compare the short-term selic rate and they say, oh, I can make money at 1.9%, so I'm gonna invest in the stock market. How, they don't look at the long-term rates, there is still seven, seven and a half percent. What are the risks that you see with these new investors? 
Well, they'll, they'll get burnt, they'll lose money, and they will learn their lessons. But I, don't, I wouldn't lose any sleep over that. The only way they will learn is through experience. So you can tell them till you're blue in the face that you're not being sensible, you should diversify. You know what I found that that's almost a waste of time. They actually hate you for saying that. So I just said, look, do whatever you want. You think you know everything, go on. You know? So Flavia, as long as it's not your brother, your sister, your parents who are doing it. Remember the old saying, a fool and his money will get part of sooner rather than, they're, they're like casino gamblers. At 11 o'clock in the evening, they're feeling pretty good. They've won a lot of money in the casino, but they plan to stay until 6 a.m. I can safely predict that by the time they leave the casino at 6 a.m., it's going to be all gone. So it happens in, in markets like this, people jump in. You know why we're getting a lot of these investors? They used to bet on other things. I, that's why I used the Robin Hood app example. These are people who used to bet on football and baseball and basketball. And when those sports are all shut down, they had nothing to bet on. So guess what they started doing? They started playing stocks. So I, unfortunately, there's nothing you can say that will make them do the right thing. So let them make their mistakes and hopefully learn from their mistakes. Thank you. Victor? Hi, Professor, thank you for your time. Uh, I have a question on uh, the dichotomy between uh, passive management and active management. You talked a lot about uh, hum how humbling a crisis can be and the difference or the lack of difference between, uh, between stupid money and smart money. So I, I'd like to, to ask you, what, what do you think the, the future looks like when it comes to the difference between uh, passive and active management? Bleak. Do, do you think we're close to- It looks bleak. I'll, I'll cut to the chase. It looks bleak. Active investing is on a slow, long train to nowhere. And I, you know, I, I don't see anything in active investing that would lead me to believe that it's somehow going to change its ways. Now, I, and I look at the big active investing firms and I can safely predict that 10 years from now, they'll be half the size of what they are today, or maybe even a quarter of the size. You know why? Because much of active investing is built on mean reversion. Basically, it's, it's very, I mean, that's basically it. You know, they can use all their fancy models. It's built on mean reversion. The things revert back to the way they used to be. You buy low PE stocks, hope they revert back to the average. And I think the world has caught up with them. The, the way I describe it, the world's become flatter. 30 years ago, if you were an active investor, you had better data than me, better models than me, better tools than me today. Okay. What's the difference between some guy in Boston running a fidelity fund and me sitting in uh, San Diego on my personal computer? I can do everything he does, have access to exactly the same data that he does. He has nothing he brings to the table. And not surprisingly, the market is going to give nothing back. And do you think, Professor, that uh, this, this difference between uh, active and passive management is going to, uh, to, to decrease even more uh, as computers get more powerful and, and I don't know. No, I, 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 I don't think computer, there's only so much that AI or computers are going to add to the process. Once the data is widely available and the basic tools are available, then you're playing at the margin. So. I think that that's why if active investing is waiting for um, AI to come and save them or big data to come and save them, they're waiting for the wrong thing. It's not going to do it because if your investing approach is mechanical, a machine will always be better at doing it than you are. That's, that's the truth. And a lot of active investing is so mechanical that I look at what they do and say, why would I pay you one and a half percent of my wealth every year to do this day after day? And that's basically the realization and, and the revolution that, that created this with ETFs, not index funds. Because ETFs, I can take any mechanical strategy and I can create an ETF that does its strategy for a fraction of the cost. So I think active investing has met the enemy and it's looking back at, it, at, them, at them in the mirror. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I would like to end this event. So thank you very much, Professor, for the attention with the Brazilian charter holders. And uh, thank you very much for the attendance, everyone, and see you in our next event. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Professor. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.